So when you see people that have chronic illness and cancer, their perception of how they feel deep down about themselves is protected like by a titanium ball. So hypnotherapist actually, you know, when you go down more on the line of chronic illness, uh, most of the induction methods aren't going to bypass that because it's so protected. So I use a frequency that opens that right up. Once we open that perception, that, that barrier, that critical faculty, then we can pipeline to the deepest source of wherever it came from. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Tanner Dajne. I'm the host of Self-Sabotage Solutions. Today, I'm very grateful and very humble to have Dr. Gabe Roberts here on the line. He's a subconscious healer, a psychosomatic doctor, a fa the founder of uh, Holographic Manipulation Therapy, which I've had a little bit of exposure to through uh, one of your students, a world expert in reversing childhood traumas. Uh, and I've been following you for a while. You know, I really like your posts, very insightful always, um, and very excited to have you on and talk with you all about you know, self-sabotage, about the subconscious mind, and about you know the the healing modality, the holographic manipulation therapy that you created, because um, I find it's very interesting, and I I'm really interested to hear like kind of how you kind of came about building that up. But can you uh, introduce yourself? You know, if there's anything I missed, please you know talk about it. Where are you located, also? Right. Uh, so thank you for having me here, Tanner. Um, of and I currently live in the very northeast corner of Oklahoma. I live in the bit of the Ozark Mountains that kind of peak in, that spill over from uh, the north part of Arkansas into Oklahoma. So I'm surrounded by beautiful uh, landscape scenery in the Ozarks. <laughs> and I work 100% uh, through Zoom with clients um, from located from all around the world. And basically, my specialty is psychosomatic medicine. Uh, if I had to describe what this would be, it would... Um, be a number of uh, the effective treatment and reversal of a number of physiological illnesses uh, from various kinds, from autoimmune to uh, neurological degeneration diseases, uh, even cancer, that all have at its roots uh, repressed emotions, usually from uh, childhood trauma or even times in the womb. That's where I spend a majority of my time with, with clients. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Awesome. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, so like things like fibromyalgia and like other things like that, like I know I saw a post yesterday about like breathing problems, which kind of piques my interest because I know I had asthma when I was growing up. Um, not really as much anymore, but I was just curious about that. I was like, wow. So like, that was a very insightful thing. Like I was, I would never have heard anything about that. So I was just like, you always have like very interesting like takes on things. I'm like, where does he learn all this information? Uh, so is it like you're working with clients and that's where you find all these like these ideas or where, where have you uh, found a lot of these like like insights? Uh, from various resources. Um, and, you know, throughout the last several years, there's been a growing collaboration of of. Uh, mind and body, a, a growing an awareness of it. Now, this isn't something that is new. This is something that's always been known to even the most primitive of tribal people, perhaps in, you know, uh, Papua New Guinea or areas in the Amazon, all the way back to the Aborigines in Australia. They, with having no scientific background and no science to actually, you know, study in that area, they understand there's a an unalterable connection between mind and body mm -hmm. so much to the fact that if there's let's say a person a man who has rage in their village who has a, an emotional shift of rage perhaps um, all the other men will quickly gather around this man and take him away from the village <laughs> and then they reiterate things to him to let him know what a valuable asset he is to the village how they need him how they need uh, his contribution you know to to survive they take them away from the village um, if there is a woman that's pregnant. They will do everything they can to create space between this woman and this man because um, they understand that the mind and body is very powerful, and they know that without the science. Today, we have the science. 
Um, I have a huge collaboration of what's called mind beyond the body or mind beyond the brain. And it just basically gives a, a plethora of information from various people around the world of how measurable things are like our emotions and our thoughts at a distance, what we can do when we think about something, when we put an intention towards something, whether it's plant, whether it's water, whether it's, um, you know, ideas or something like that. So our thoughts are very powerful. And from Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi's work, he shows that about 99.994% of our thoughts are below the threshold of our awareness. They don't show up in our conscious mind as the little voice. Um, sometimes they can, but it's going to be in a voice of someone who more likely has passed. And it's going to be someone who you knew that you had a tremendous amount of trust with. So if you ever are doing something, you're driving or you're on a road trip or doing something and you hear a voice that you know is someone you knew in the past, perhaps, and they tell you to stop, you know, pay attention you best pull your car over and give it a good inspection. So um, there's been stories of this kind of thing occurring, um, even in the Army. Uh, back in, I think it was World War II, a colonel heard a voice. Um, he yelled. He was on a Jeep doing a reconnaissance mission. He yelled uh, to the driver, stop the Jeep. And he's like, you know, what's going on? I heard something. I didn't hear anything. And he walks around the Jeep and the front tires just about ready to pop off. And it had they went 10 feet more, the Jeep would have careened right off of a, uh, a, a a vast cliff. So those are just different ways that this non-physical side of ourself can communicate with us. And we're all connected through one vast mind. And that's what I think that these studies are showing, you know, um, how, a, how Cleve Baxter can have um, emotions towards a plant and the plant reacts how Lynn McTaggart's group can have intentions towards plants, making them grow, making them glow brighter, and they and they glow brighter. Um, different things like this that all demonstrate we're all part of this non-physical mind, but it's our earliest perceptions that we pick up in the womb that give us a skewed view of life through the lens of humanity. And that's where um, what I would call us getting separated from the divine occurs. In the womb, when we first hear um, mom and dad arguing or mom and dad uh, worried or mom and dad frustrated about the pregnancy or something, suddenly we go from only knowing bliss, only knowing divine, to it's equivalent to having a pie slapped right in the face um, <laughs> telling us, hey, welcome to welcome to the party, pal, you know, in Bruce Willis's voice. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where we become separated from that uh, and we don't become separated but our perception is so strong that it is what separates us from all that all knowing that all um, uh, you know encompassing divine and I've studied about 300 near-death experiences a little over that interviewed half a dozen people that have had near-death experiences or what I would actually term near life experiences because they when they had that epiphany when they left the physical body momentarily um, they had a glimpse of what life would be like with absolutely no burdens whatsoever of any kind mm -hmm. and then they come back to the physical body so it's more likely uh, termed near near life experience but each one of them agree there's a general consensus that when we leave a physical body there is a tremendous state of bliss that's that's all along. Everyone says that a tremendous state of bliss, acceptance like they've never felt uh, bright light um, and just just overall just peace and joy like they've never imagined possible. So if that happens when we leave the physical body, we have to assume that that's what starts out when we're before we're ever conceived, before we're ever born. And so my work is about getting people back to that point, getting people back to that point where they can actually have the perception that they're one with divine while in a physical body and everything else is just a human perception. And when you understand it's a human perception, it's not necessarily real. All the guilt, the shame, the, the other things, you know, don't have near the weight that they carry. Wow. That's, that's powerful stuff. I, that really hits home too. thinking about like, 
I mean, I, I totally agree with what all, everything you're saying. Like the the parents like talking before their little baby's pre, um, you know, like while in the womb, um, and how that can actually affect the baby. Like, you know, I totally believe that because you know everything's. I, I was actually just finished reading um, the Biology of Belief by Dr. Bruce Lipton. You know, kind of learning how like everything's really just energy and everything's connecting and speaking to each other. Like the collective kind of consciousness we're talking about. How you know it's like a, a divine kind of thing um and i'm so grateful that for my son like me and my wife were like planned on it and we were like ready for it you know and, like we were very grateful when like we were like yes we're so excited like when it came you know um but like it's it's true because a lot of people don't plan for it and then they're just like oh no i'm pregnant and like i can imagine that like a, a beautiful like baby like soul is coming in like oh i'm not wanted you know like that that had pro right. profound impacts well it it Initially, it, it does have a profound uh, impact and, and good for you on, on recognizing that with your wife. And what you'll want to do, Tanner, is continue to feed that earliest perception of welcome. Welcome mm -hmm. here. We welcome you in our presence every day, every day, every day. Because um, those initial perceptions suddenly become guarded. Mm -hmm. Because essentially, they're when, when a, a child is conceived, is when they are the most absorbent it's when they learn the most mm -hmm. they they learn the most right after conception and after every passing hour after that up until around age five that learning ability slowly um, begins to uh, slow a bit every every hour and time until around five six seven they've already have a direct um jigsaw puzzle piece complete there's mm -hmm. been enough pieces put in place enough little perceptions enough little experiences enough feelings enough emotions that they have a huge jigsaw puzzle piece put together of all these pieces that give them a rock solid foundation of their place in the world if they belong if the world's threatening um mm -hmm. those kind of things and if if a if a mother and a and a father decide oh you know we're not supposed to have this pregnancy uh, this isn't supposed to happen that creates a perception in that child but that doesn't mean it's doomed yeah if they own up to it and they say you know what we had we did this we're going to own up to, we're going to we're going to um take care of this child we're going to make sure it gives it the best life ever okay now there's a new perception formed that's different than this one mm -hmm. and depending on which one gets fed the most compounding through years and years of more and more experiences build that perception up to where it gets so powerful that it gets to the point where once it gets to a certain level, the subconscious mind is the most powerful goal achieving agency known to man. Mm -hmm. Once that gets to a certain weight, that perception gets to a certain weight, the subconscious mind will do everything in its power to make that manifest. That's the, that's the stuff I see in chronic illnesses and cancer. It's something where if we go back in the womb and mother and dad didn't want the child. They're not supposed to have this child. There's talks of abortions. So that puts in place what is called a self-mutilation program. And throughout the years of life, every experience they have on top of that, that says something about they don't belong or nobody wants them or the, the all famous one I hear all the time. Mom and dad would be much better off if I were dead. Yep. Okay. So when they have that kind of perception built well below the surface of awareness, and let's say the child turns 12 years old, you know, he just grows to where he's 12 and he's at school playing dodgeball with other kids and they're picking teams. And there's two groups of two groups of kids picking dodgeball teams. And this 12 year old child gets picked last. That experience in that moment gives him a feeling it gives him a perception and because it matches that earliest one it adds through the law of compounding okay mm -hmm. it adds the weight of that belief of being picked last to that perception of i'm not wanted i'm not supposed to be here all below his conscious awareness mm -hmm. so where eventually around the age of 35 to 40 those perceptions have built so much, so significant that now they're a priority to the body. And that is the stuff of chronic illness. That's the, that's the foundation of chronic illness. Wow. Yeah. That's very powerful stuff. And that 
uh, what you're talking about, about like the beginning of that was like makes me think of the Aristotle quote, like give me a, a, a man before you know the age of uh, seven and I'll show you the man. Um, right. Give me the, give me the boy and I'll show yeah, you yeah, the man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what. Um, and it totally makes sense to me because like I watch my son and he's just like absorbing everything like he can. Like he's just like learning so much. Um, and from what I've learned about like the subconscious mind, you know, it's the, this that theta state that they're in. Or their their conscious subconscious is like super high highly aware and was well, to protect them right is to make it so they can fit in with their surroundings to learn from like their well parents. they're just yeah they're just like a right now they're they're like a blank hard drive yeah and they're it's not just state of state um I I think state of state's important but I do know of people who spend years in theta state and still don't get anything done they, they still don't get change work done they listen to headphones they get in theta state and and nothing changes so brain waves are important but i don't think they're everything when it comes to that um, there's other factors involved uh, a child's um, intuition is spot on a uh, their nervous system is voracious in its appetite the mirror neurons um, are twin turbo charts at this point they're just working um at a max capacity compared to what we can ever have as adults mirror neurons are the brain centers that mimic uh they will go active if somebody's doing an activity in front of you in other words if i um pulled out a, a bottle of water or something like this in front of you took the cap off and drank it the same brain centers inside of you that would be used for you to take a cap off a bottle of water and drink it go active this is how horror movies work. This is how things like pornography work because of mirror neurons kicking on. Well, at that stage, at one, his mirror neurons are just voracious and his his um, abilities, his intuitive abilities, he can pick up moods in people that are in other rooms that he can't even see. So the, the best thing to do for that age of child, and I, I wish I would have done this for my kids, but it was too little too late. Um, you know, so I have traumatized them in some ways by not using the, the, the work that I do has changed me a tremendous amount, um, regressing people back to cause all the time. But if I could do it all over again, and what I would, the advice I'd give to you is when you see your son, have it in your heart, deep down, deep down, not with your words, not even with your actions. Okay. Not saying those aren't important. Right. But the most important thing is deep down in your heart, when you look at him, tell him, I welcome you in my presence and I'm filled with joy that you're in my presence right now. Mm -hmm. You're developing something in him that'll be warm and fully matured the way it's supposed to be. Be an emotional available parent. So anytime he needs something, he's fussing, he's crying. It doesn't mean he's bottle and diaper. Yeah. It means that he needs to be held. You know, and when he needs to be held, he needs to be held in that way of, you know, being welcomed and warmed, not just being held while you're on the phone or over here, because that's remember their intuition is is um, their ability to see beyond the lines of what your real intention is, is um, just unparalleled compared to what we what we get as adults. And I think the best mediums, I think the best people that are uh, gifted for picking up that intuition are able to put themselves back into that same state of childlike. And that's what they can do. They're using basically their nervous system the same way as a small child is, but they're doing it as an adult. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, so like the, the feeling like the motion is what you're saying essentially is like, is really, really important. Like what you're actually feeling like in your heart um your yeah your intentions mm -hmm. your intentions are everything yep. intentions um i don't know if you're familiar with Rene Rene Payok's work uh he is a scientist who phd and he studied the intention of baby chickens and in doing so baby chickens were able to actually um alter the behavior of robots baby chickens mm -hmm. wow <laughs> so uh, again you know how can a baby chicken change the behavior of a robot Mm -hmm. Well, it's because we're all made of atoms. And at the smallest point of those atoms, if you go deep, deep within the atom, where you get to like zero point field, the nature of that is responsiveness. It responds to everything. That's why if you see something happening in your life, 
a reoccurring theme over and over. It's not something out there. It's trying to show you something about yourself. It's a reflection. And so intention is really powerful. And of course, if you have the intention of that, your behaviors are going to show that as well. But oftentimes people are just kind of going through the behaviors and their intention is, oh, I'd rather be doing about five other things in this right now. And that gives a mixed messages to a child. Adults, we don't pick that up as much, right? Uh, he said he loved me, you know, those kind of things. As a child, though, you're not going to fool them. So the intention is is really key. That intention will um, nurture their brain circuits and their emotional circuits the way they should be to where when they get older, um, they'll be able to handle things much more calm, cool, and collected as young adults. Well, that's really powerful. So, and and I, I, I can totally see how that's the the truth. Uh, I'll have to make sure I apply that in my life. I, I would feel like I probably have that intention. I, I, I'm trying to look at them. I'm just like, man, I'm so grateful. Like, I feel that like, it's like that gratefulness for him being my life. Um, but like, let's say like a parent, you know, doesn't do that. Right. And like, they get to the age of 30 or 40 where they are just that it's the self mutilation program. So what? then, then it's like the whole, the holographic manipulation theory. Is that kind of your answer to it? Is like that, how you address it? Like, what does that look like? So I use anything that works. Um, okay. <laughs> holographic manipulation therapy is a collaboration of several different um, arts put together. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to take this moment to kind of address, it's been brought to my attention, there's some rumors floating around perhaps about me, um, plagiarizing somebody else's work. My question to that is, um, at this level, if you're doing something that, that's meaningful and changing somebody's life, who hasn't? Who hasn't been plagiarized in some way, shape, or form? Um, a preacher who gives a wonderful sermon. Another preacher who wants to mimic that is going to pattern his, preach, his, his sermon off of that preacher. Okay, The founder of what's called Transform Destiny, a group of hypnotherapists and NLP practitioners, the founder of this organization has done presentations right alongside Marissa Peer. And he has mentioned that the work he sees her doing is um, is basically Elman's method. It's David Elman's method with hypnotic, um, I'm sorry, with regression components added to it. Yeah. Those are his words, not mine. Uh, Tony Robbins, a uh, very famous man who's changed thousands of lives, hundreds of thousands of lives perhaps, has mimicked his off of what's called neuro-linguistic programming. So um, – and the person that I'm accused of taking his work from, uh, his name is Brent Bond. And the questions, the format that he uses actually came from a New Zealand psychologist named David Grove. And David Grove has a technique called um, clean language where he uses memories and compares them to metaphors, which is what Brent does. Okay, um, But there's a specific questioning system that... Um, that David Grove has used, and it's the exact same thing that Brent Bond uses, and it's very similar to what I use when it comes to describing these perceptions, these memories that we carry within us. And this is nothing new, uh, certainly in the change world work that I just talked about. In fact, uh, Nobel Prize winner Sinclair Lewis wrote that if you kidnap a man, you blindfold him, and you take them to downtown in any of the major cities in the United States, where they, except for a few exceptions. And you blindfold this man, you take him there, and you remove his blindfold. He could stay there for a week and wouldn't be able to know what city he's in hmm. because of all the downtowns look so similar. They all have similar businesses. They're all decorated similar. The streets are decorated the same way. The streets are all formatted the same way. And what this shows is earliest business owners that are responsible for starting these first cities were all playing a game of copycat. They are all, the first thing a person does whenever they start a business is they look around at somebody else's and they want to make sure their business looks like that person's. And this is nothing new to the human experience. This is, this starts in, you know, early childhood. You can look at a playground and you'll see kids wanting to wear the same kind of shoes or wanting to wear the same kind of hairstyles, the same kind of backpacks, because they all unconsciously want to be part of the gang. Um, so if someone is 
ever taken any of my learnings and my teachings and worked with me one on one, um, and they they think that I've just taken somebody else's work, my message is you really haven't learned anything at all, um, unfortunately. But holographic manipulation therapy is a hybridization. It's a, a of several different methods from Russian sports psychology to the best things that hypnosis has to offer, um, all the way to uh, understanding of the non-physical mind of holograms that come from Carl Prebrum and uh, the work that the CIA and the United States Army has done with the mind beyond the brain that include things like remote viewing. Okay, So all of these things are collaborated in a system that allow us to do deep, deep change work with clients, whatever it needs to for the for the ultimate um, for the ultimate goal of putting forgiveness and love deep, deep, deep within their identity, because that's what's going to produce healing. You don't need to do anything to heal a person. Their body, if left alone, if left alone, is a self-lubricating, self-healing mechanism on its own. It's the problem is there's not enough love and forgiveness deep within that and that and that deepest, deepest center of them uh, to allow those things to happen. So uh, some of the methods we use in holographic manipulation therapy are incredibly unique. Um, I have studied different methods for years, uh, including frequencies, different types of frequencies. And what I found is frequencies, positive suggestions, things like that, on a large part, make a great whitewash, but not a great filler. So you can use frequencies on a person and... You might get some change work, but chances are it's 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 hitting surface level um, perceptions of them and not the deepest, deepest, deepest perception. So in my work, we allow people to uh, like the last work, the last woman I worked on was Thursday and uh, a high functioning doctor, very healthy doctor um, contacts me and has deep feelings of dread. Every morning she wakes up. Every night she goes to bed. Even on her best day, she has this just cloud of dread that hangs around her. And this dread is, is littered with sadness as well. When we started kind of describing the dread, there was sadness that kind of almost like uh, acid reflex, sadness kind of coming up in her. So I used a specific frequency to open up what's called a critical faculty. This is the part that uh, hypnotherapists are trained to kind of bypass or trick there's a part of your mind that acts as a barrier protecting perceptions. Remember earlier I talked about that self-mutilation perception? Mm -hmm. Well, if someone has something like that, wouldn't it be easy to change? Well, the stronger that perception gets over time on compounding events, the more it's protected by this critical faculty. This barrier becomes like a thin sheet of paper and then several sheets of paper and then a stack of paper to a thin piece of leather to thick leather, to leather almost like you'd find on the saddle of a horse, thick leather, to now it's a thin piece of aluminum, to a thicker piece of aluminum, to a piece of steel, all the way to a piece of titanium. So when you see people that have chronic illness and cancer, their perception of how they feel deep down about themselves is protected like by a titanium ball. So hypnotherapists, actually, you know, when you go down more on the line of chronic illness, uh, most of the induction methods aren't going to bypass that because it's so protected. So I use a frequency that opens that right up. Once we open that perception, that that barrier, that critical faculty, then we can pipeline to the deepest source of wherever it came from. And in this woman, that dread, we went all the way into that memory. I had her look down at her hands, and she, I said, describe your hands. Look at them, the inside, the back, the fronts. Describe your hands to me. And she said, they're man hands. <laughs> and I said, uh, and I said, what's your name? Mm -hmm. And she said, Charlie. And suddenly she realized that she was her grandfather wow. and she was in the hospital and there was a pregnancy and the grandmother and grandfather were irate at each other, yelling, like upset, cussing at each other. There was a pregnancy involved here. They are in the hospital. And right then and there, I used some of these methods uh, like remote viewing and things like that to to I, I put a little sidebar here grandma or grandpa we went right into grandpa went all the way down to when he was a child she's doing all of this and i'm just giving her the cues to do it so she immediately saw her grandfather 
all the way as a child. And I said, what, what's the biggest perception he has? And it was sadness. That's where that sadness was coming from. Okay. So once we saw sadness there, we went back, we looked at grandma, we pipelined deep into her and her biggest trait that she carried, the biggest emotional state that she was always in as a child was dread. Mm -hmm. So for this woman, we played that scene over a few times of the uh, hospital incident. But after the realization that that sadness and that dread had nothing to do with this pregnancy, it was long there before I was ever involved. It had nothing to do with that. And once she realized that, she was actually able to have compassion and forgiveness. Okay. And then I said, okay, play that scene one more time. She played the scene one more time. And now her grandma and grandpa were absolutely embracing each other. So it wasn't me having her reframe a memory. It was me having her look at the pain that was involved in that and realizing that that pain had nothing to do with this pregnancy. It was already there. Now the pregnancy was affected by it, but it was completely separate. And when a person realizes that, you know, let's say a father who uh, was a drunk, who uh, was unavailable for his child and the child grows up to be a very um, uh, shielded off, uh, guarded um, person, if they ever can pipeline to that and realize that the father's drunken behavior and absent had nothing to do with them, it was just his own pain he was carrying, there's suddenly uh, not only compassion that comes up, but real forgiveness because you can look at them and say, you know, you were in pain yourself and I forgive you for spilling that over to me when you didn't want to. Like a hot kettle, you know, on a, mm -hmm. on a stove. You just keep it getting hotter and hotter until it spills out. That's essentially what happens when people are carrying pain and traumas that aren't theirs, but it spills over on someone else. And when they have that realization, that's when forgiveness can begin. Mm -hmm. And once forgiveness begins, you know, the, the dread, the sadness this woman carried because she realized they weren't hers, um, completely changed and tears of joy flowed out of her eyes after that. So it's about a matter of helping a person get forgiveness and, and realizing that the people that hurt you, it's not that they hurt you intentionally any more than a spilled, any more than a kettle wants to spill anything on the, um, on the stove. You know, it's just a matter. It gets so boiled up so, so deeply, so powerful that it spills over sometimes. And that's what happens whenever uh, you see any kind of abuse, any kind of um, neglect, any kind of uh, physical trauma, whatever it is, it's somebody else's pain acting out, spilling over on someone else. And if you're in close proximity with that person, if they happen to be your family member or a parent, uh, it's going to spill over on you. Yeah, I feel like it often gets taken out on the close family members, right? Like, because exactly. they're, they're in the closest proximity. <laughs> they're they're the stove under the boiling kettle. Yeah. You know, they're not the they're not the neighbor, and uh, you know or the colleague or something else. So, and it's unfortunate. And I think the natural human tendency is to not do that. It's just the fact that there's so much buried inside that person and more and more events experiences happen. And it's like equivalent to turning that kettle up and letting the thing boil and spill over. So, well, so you mentioned a frequency that opens up that, are you able to share what frequency, like what tune that is? Like, what is, is like, well, it's a specific frequency, and I go into depths with this in our PhD course. Oh, okay? okay. In our PhD course, I give the the name of the person uh, who actually did it. It's a doctor, and I came and I came. Um, let's see, I learned about these years ago as a functional medicine doctor. Whenever I was um, getting out of practice. Uh, whenever I was getting out of college, uh, I'm sorry, chiropractic college, and I was starting a functional medicine practice, and I was a, what you could call a diehard mainstream scientist, okay? Um, I, I questioned vaccines. I knew some of them were, you know, maybe a little bit dangerous, but I also thought, well, the science makes sense, though, on some aspects. Mm -hmm. Then I started getting into literature on it, and I thought, well, this doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> But I, but I had a radical change from going from your traditional standard scientist doing scientific work that I learned in academia to wanting to do things that got results. Right. And that means, you know, 
not doing the mainstream of just adjust and refer out. They have rheumatoid arthritis, adjust them and refer them out. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Adjust them to an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, I had an orthopedic surgeon meet with me a while back who had bursitis. And uh, despite the gallons of cortisol he used, the surgeries, everything else, he still had bursitis. He heard me on a podcast, sat down with me. And as weird as that might seem, a chiropractor working through Zoom with a orthopedic surgeon who's got bursitis <laughs> but it but basically whatever whatever it takes to get results you're going to learn that um not from academia you're going to learn that from specific little groups even though they still are doing scientific methods or scientifically um evaluated and and methods that have survived the scientific method they're going to be outside of mainstream so whenever i got to this journey this point and a journey for me when there was a fork and i started going down the non-traditional ways, there was a time when I had to learn how to muscle test. Yep. And um, I didn't know how. What I mean by that is I sat there with a group of doctors and professionals, and I'd have my hands on their feet or their arm, and, I, and I'd see a doctor go, look, it's simple. Show me a yes, show me a no. See, show me a yes, show me a no. Uh, that It's that non-physical mind. It's not just this person's subconscious it's everything and everywhere. And you're just seeing a little bit, you're just seeing a little hint of it here, right? Responsiveness, like I said before. Okay. And I would go up to this person and say, show me a yes, show me a no. And nothing would change. I'd do his leg, show me a yes, show me a no, no change. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And an early mentor saw this and knew the potential I had for growth because I was always there in the beginning and I was always the last one to leave of every class we had of this. And he took me to a another doctor's practitioner, uh, another doctor. And we did, went to a, a different state where I sat with this doctor in his home. And there was uh, – I couldn't muscle test, and he saw that. And he used one of these frequencies right then and there on me. And I felt a change, and I could, and I could suddenly – muscle test. I was like, whoa, this is cool. I could suddenly get that responsive to me, to this. And why that is, is because I had an upper brain block. I had something inside of me uh, that was preventing that from happening. And this frequency did that. Now, once, of course, I learned this, I took this man's work, his frequencies, and I started using them every client I could. And the results were staggering. I mean, I would get rid of, uh, I'll just say this, entities and people. They'd be carrying something dark you do a couple frequencies and all of a sudden they sit up and they go, Ooh, I like this. I don't know what it is, but I like this. I feel better. And you release something out of that person suddenly that wasn't supposed to be there. And what I found in doing this over the years was it was, I was whitewashing them. I wasn't changing that earliest perception that was in the womb. I might've been impacting them, mm -hmm. but that perception stayed there and like a root being left in the ground. If you cut over the grass, you leave the root there, it'll grow back. Mm -hmm. And what I found a big pattern of is the more I have frequencies I use on people, the more times those patterns, those unwanted, um, whatever it was they were carrying, whether it was feelings of shame or not being able to connect source, guilt, uh, hurt from uh, being emotionally, physically abused, whatever it is, those things would slowly come back even using these frequencies. So throughout the years, I thought, well, you know, I kind of put this on the side. I knew they were powerful, but it seemed like I was whitewashing them. Now with the PhD level um, education, the PhD level courses we do in our psychosomatic university, I have found a way for people to vent out all of that. It's like pockets of venom they've carried their whole life. Those perceptions I was mentioning earlier, protected by a critical faculty, can be a, like a self um, self-mutilation program. It's like a pocket of venom. And if you reframe the memory, which can be done in hypnosis and be done in, in um, holographic work, Brent Bond's work, if you reframe the memory, you change it to where suddenly it's not as painful when they think about that. But if there's energetic signatures left in there, in other words, an energetic signature stuck there still, that's separate from the memory, and you leave that there, the person will still have symptoms. They'll still... Um, have some kind of uh, mechanisms in their body will still show that there's something that needs to get evaluated and cleared. What I mean by energy is for every experience we have as a human, 
it not only is a, a holographic memory or a three-dimensional memory or something, and I'm seeing things now. There's literature, there's there's stuff out now that are showing that there's even some holes in the holographic memory concept. So our memories might not be holograms. They might be even something else, neither here nor there. You know, um, they they can play things in our morphic field that have a resonance to us. Many times I've regressed people back and I, I have them look at their hands and they see claws. Or I've even had a woman once who, very high executive president, uh, not one to make things up, looked down at her hands and her hands were webbed, webbed hands. You know, how do you explain that? The soul can take infinite forms. And we're multidimensional beings. And sometimes those multidimensional aspects of us that have a have a resonance to something will have power over us when we get into certain circumstances. We'll have a body feeling show up, and it has to do with something in a field that we're carrying that might have nothing to do with the memory that we got in childhood or in the womb. Okay. So uh, what I found is a way to vent out those um those pockets of venom sometimes we need to let it be as ugly as it needs to be for people that were, had boundary violations that were you know severely traumatized they need to get stuff out they have to get stuff out so we let it be as ugly as it needs to be in that moment once they're done venting all that it's like a syringe you stuck in that pocket of venom and pull out then i use the frequencies different frequencies for going in and filling those voids up okay so it's just years of painstaking work, working with people, watching the differences, and again, learning from anyone I could that had any kind of knowledge from this, whether it's Soviet sports psychology or whether it's uh, a hypnosis class, you know, or it's something from the CIA or something from the United States Army that is talking about the mind beyond the body and how people can remote view, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. Those documents are now all declassified. You can oh, yeah. find them. You can find them and, and give accounts of how someone can go into a meditative state, get in, get out of those perceptions of their body and get into the non-physical ethereal that we're all connected to and suddenly go you know, 40 feet down in the ground and view a bunker, count the number of trucks, look at the badges on their hats and everything and come back out and have a full um, you know, explanation that matches exactly what's there. So – that's what's fascinating to me is that we're all connected by this universal mind, but it's our perceptions that get put in place in the womb and begin to build with additional experiences that form a jigsaw puzzle piece of who we are and how we see the world after that. That's interesting. Actually, I was just out on a podcast recently where we were talking about like the difference between thinking like between like, like binary, like, like I'm you, like I am me and you are you compared to like, everything is one and everything's connected. And that's what that just made me think of. It was like, well, technically like everything is connected, like through quantum physics, you know, like, and, and right. well, we were new before quantum physics, everything is made up of atoms. So everything's made up of the same stuff, but now we know like everything's just energy through quantum physics. So like makes total sense that the frequencies can really change things. And, um, but again, they like, have I, know, to I know like grounding is really impactful because you can get some of the earth frequencies and like energies into your body. So like it's it really makes sense to me that you're talking about like the frequencies, like being able to open up the part of you. So like when it opens it up, that allows you to like address it and probably for some of it to escape then too, right? Like, well, it's or, it's it's not like um, you know if you're opening it for that. What you're doing is you're you're opening it to um, allow yourself to go in there and change that perception because oh, okay. it's so heavily guarded. Let me give you an example, okay? Just just say this, and this is a perception that we protect. We That's all we do is protect our perceptions without knowing it. Mm -hmm. It's a one of the foundations that I teach people is we're always going to resist anything that doesn't match our identity. We'll resist anything that doesn't match who we were, zero to five. We inherently resist it. That's why many women today that are attractive that put in a lot of work to make their hair look good and make their makeup look right still can't take a compliment. You try giving a beautiful woman a compliment, many times they'll just be like, they'll shy away, kind of step back, they'll look down. And that's just showing body sign, body language is showing that they don't believe it deep down. Why? Because when they were little, 
Nobody ever told them how beautiful and how wonderful they were. Okay. So let me give you an example of how you protect perceptions without even knowing it. Okay. I want you to say out loud and, and let your body be the, your body is a, a cosmic GPS, whether you know it or not. It, it will tell you in little feelings. You don't, you don't ever think answers. You feel answers. So I want you to say, the grass is blue and the sky is green. The grass is blue and the sky is green. And notice suddenly a little discomfort. There's a little yep. uneasiness as this barrier slams shut, mm -hmm. protecting that perception. Okay. So it's doing that because the subconscious mind is a protective mind. And the reason it has that barrier there is because it doesn't just want to allow anything in. The most powerful goal achieving agency known to man that's tenacious, um, ruthless in its ability to opportunistically peek pieces out in the environment and make things happen. That's why certain people have infections, why other people don't. Why a certain person uh, can be affected by something and another person cannot. Mm -hmm. You know, why, and if you go into Dr. Bruce Lipton's work, you'll see this why certain people can uh, be bitten by snakes drink strychnine and there's it's in the literature these uh this group of uh, southern baptists are able to drink strychnine that's laboratory tested just what was on the man's q-tip alone would kill all the researchers in that room and this man's drinking it okay same thing happens when a yogi walks on hot coals red hot coals and is unaffected because they are they have the perception that they are spiritual they fully integrate that into themselves and it's 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 so it's such shown, it's it's such a deep strong perception that they hold as true that their body makes it reality okay so the subconscious mind cannot make a simple judgment though that's the problem the most powerful goal achieving agency can cannot make a simple judgment it doesn't know right from wrong and it doesn't care so when that when you have that kind of power you have to have something that protects it, and that's that barrier. Now, oftentimes, the problem is something bad gets in before something good gets in. As in your case with you and your wife, you're telling me something good got in. We welcomed it. Man, we found out she's pregnant. We were like, yes, awesome. That's how it's supposed to be. Right. Nowadays, nowadays it's, it's something bad gets in there first, forms a perception, gets protected, as the years go through, that perception builds with like experiences, building that barrier up to where it's flimsy in the beginning to titanium by the time they're 40 years old. And that's the same thing that happens if you try to tell a depressed person how wonderful they are. Tell a person with depression what a wonderful, valuable person they are. And you'll, ex you'll see they experience the same thing that you just did by saying the grass is blue. They have a perception about themselves that... Uh, is protected, heavily guarded, and won't allow anything in that doesn't that doesn't match that. On the same token, you could tell tell an alcoholic what a low life, low grade piece of shit he is, and they'll smile. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. They'll they'll smile because it matches that earliest perception. You know. That's. That's super interesting. I, I really find like, the, I think it's, it's awesome that you took like, you know, the pieces of everything that's worked and made something new because that's, I mean, like, like you said, like things have been like, this knowledge has been around for so long. Like I know like the information about like thinking positively and these kinds of things and like hypnosis, like, like you look back at like the Stoics and like back in like Eastern cultures and like, they all talked about a lot of these kinds of things as well like energy work and things like that. So like a lot of it is just rebranded into different ways, right? Like it, it really is. <laughs> right. I mean, it really is. Uh, the gospel of Thomas and you're right. It's been, it's been, um, it's been this, the golden thread of truth. If you look at all of the different um, collaborations of what wise men have taught philosophies, what ancient scrolls have carried and kept. Now, another mentor of mine, Dr. Greg, or I'm sorry, he's not a doctor. He might as well be as, as smart as he is. Greg Braden, um, he has 
uh, depicted scrolls, these red scrolls that talk about um, the mirrors of things, the mirrors within us, the mirrors that reflect. This man went to a Tibetan cave to um, basically find and dismiss the – there was a handprint that was actually pushed into a mountain, a handprint of a um, man years ago. He put his hand into a rock-solid mountain and pushed, and his handprint's there. And Greg Braden, a scientist, went there and said, well, let me dismiss this. Let me go find this, and and you know I'll basically debunk it. Well, he went there. He saw the handprint. He put his hand in it, and he goes, my God, that's a real hand. There's no way this is faked. How can that happen? Well, this person knew of his connection with everything. And I'm sure you've heard Bruce Lipton say these these words, quantum physics is the most valid of all sciences today. It basically answers all the questions that we've had for years and years on several different theories that uh, were unable to be answered with Newtonian physics. So on top of that, um, when you look at I lost my track of thought thinking here. I, I tend to chase squirrels in my, <laughs> my mind. I tend to go off on tangents sometimes. But I had to do with Greg Braden. Oh, well, it'll come back to me. So I'm curious because, you know, you've taught, I, I know, like, I read in Bruce Lipton's book, like, there was a lot of like resistance to him talking about like the quantum physics within biology. And I'm sure you, as a scientist, you know, how you had to go away from like everything you knew. They started getting actual work. Why do you think our science is, is like that? Like, why do you think the Western science is just so like against actual like healing modalities and so like just focused on one special thing? Um well, there's many reasons because first off, again, if you look at the subconscious mind, it's the most powerful goal achieving agency known to man. And what I was going to say a minute ago that I lost track of was uh, how things have, how this has been the golden thread passed through scrolls and everything else. And Greg Braden, just one example of that in the gospel of Thomas, uh, which is a part of the Bible that was removed during Constantinus era. It says these words, Jesus Christ actually said these words. If you make the two into one, you become sons of man and you can say to the mountain, move mountain and the mountain will move. So if you make the two into one, you can say to the mountain, move mountain, and the mountain will move. So imagine that Jesus Christ saying those words. The Gospel of Thomas is basically his life. If you look at King King James Version, it goes from infant to 30, 33. What happened in between, right? Mm -hmm. It talks about his life. So if Jesus can say, if you make the two into one, you can have the power to move mountains, and yet Lynn McTaggart's group can look at plants and focus with an intention to make a plant grow green. How is that different? It's the exact same power. Mm -hmm. So now your question is, well, why is this, why is all of this um, considered taboo? Why is this considered, uh, you know, not scientific, perhaps things like that? Because there's a real message. Because if, if people knew of who they really were, consciousness compressed in light form that's all we are mm -hmm. if we knew of that and we knew our power without any perception other you know than that we wouldn't feel like little old me i have no power we would be massive creators creating our lives the way we want and this kind of information has been greatly hidden anything that can make a big difference a big change in your life and you just one little shift can make a huge difference in how you feel about life, how you feel about yourself, waking up, being happy every day. Um, anything that has that potential has been greatly hidden from us. And it, and essentially what, hap what has been replaced is things that give us these perceptions. And it's between consumer scientists and these equalologists, these people that say, you know, everyone's equal no matter what, you know. Um, and we're seeing the, the consequences of that spill out and, uh, you know, sports and, and, and gender confusion, all these different things come out now. Um, but basically, it, it's there to keep us from realizing our true power, keep us from realizing that everything from dust to feathers to the rings on Saturn, all of that is governed by laws. And when you use those laws in your life, 
you'll find that you can always win. And uh, that stuff is is greatly hidden from us. And we're under this we're under this uh, big understanding that we're just flesh robots. And yeah. if something goes wrong, it's just your body acting up and your body's attacking itself. And, um, you know, it, it, it's quite the opposite of actually what we really are. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's definitely like hidden from the public. Right. Uh, makes me think of, I think it was Neville Goddard, his, uh, the strangest secret where he talks about, well, it's strange because no one knows about, or because, I mean, it, it's known, but it's, you know, it's a secret because, oh, well, okay, I guess I, I, confusing how he says it, but you know, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's out there. It's like, it's known, but at the same time, it's still a secret. Like if you go up to talk to people, like they'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, are you like right. some kind of mystical, like woo woo person is like, well, no, like this is actual science, like backed by it. And that's why I love um, like what you're doing. I love like reading like through Bruce Lipton's books and things like that, because like, it gives me like a scientific background for like the, the work that I do, you know, where I help people with like understand the subconscious mind and things like that. So, um, I really love that bit because it's, it's, it's so fascinating to me that just like learning more about like the scientific principles of it. I'm um, like, just how you can actually change, make those changes. The strangest secret. Did you mean Earl Nightingale by chance? Oh, Earl Nightingale. That's that. Yeah, that was what it was. Yeah. Yep. Neville Goddard's teachings are fantastic. Yeah, Neville Goddard and, too. And Earl Nightingale is one of my favorites to listen to. Mm-hmm. But you're right. The strangest secret is, uh, it all comes down to the strangest secret. All comes down to this: you become what you think about. Yep. Mm-hmm. And and we now know that thoughts are things that affect other things. They're measurable. And they have an impact. The most important thing you want to realize, though, is Your most dominant thoughts are the ones below the surface of your awareness. Mm -hmm. They show up in little icky body feelings, little uh, pings here and there, uh, unpleasant sensations. When you find yourself in a situation that doesn't match it or, um, or some kind of contextual experience happens and it gives you an unpleasant feeling, what that's doing is it's, it's showing you there's some area in there that's perhaps a psychological wound that still needs to be healed so uh, the way that when you when you really heal you can look at someone who's thrown stones at you or flung mud at you doing something like that we all have those people um, if you don't have anyone that's done that you're not doing any good of you're not doing any big change work okay <laughs> and one of one of my mentors said that You'll know when you're succeeding because people are going to start bashing you, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the best things you can do to know if you're healed or not is when you see that person in your mind and there's no sting or ping and you could actually see that person have a victory, something victorious could happen to them, something big, like they win a million dollars in the lottery or something. Mm-hmm. And if you could celebrate that for that person, you know you've healed. You know you've healed that 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 psychological wound is healed. If there's still a ping or discomfort somewhere, it has nothing to do with them. It's something that you're carrying. It's a, these things are messengers. When you have someone, if somebody walked up and just cussed you out or somebody, um, you know, spit in your face or you're driving down the road and a rock hits your windshield and chips it, these are all ways the universe is showing you a message on where inner work needs to be done. You know, and the more of this inner work you do, the more of those uh, wounds that you heal, you actually become brighter and light. You become brighter and light, and you actually become more drawing to people. People will seek you out for um, that because they're not going to be able to put their finger on it, but there's a vibration of harmony that they're going to be drawn to. So uh, one of the things you want to do if you want to do change work for people is Never stop working on yourself. Oh, yeah. Never stop working on yourself every day, every day. So, yeah, one of the, the people, those are the people that get ahead and, and become great healers are the ones that just work on themselves every day. I always, I always say like the best investment you can ever make in life is investment in yourself. I feel like that, that is true. Like I've, since I've started this, this journey of like trying to make myself better, I, I've noticed like, there's no like, okay, I'm done. I'm perfect now. Right. Like it's like a progression, constant progression kind of thing. Like, Oh, 
well, I dealt with this, but then this thing came up or I, I dealt with this. And then I noticed, Hey, like there's, there's something else I got to deal with. Um, but you, you're talking about like those like pinging sensations, like, like, like when I said, like the sky was green and the grass is blue, um, makes me think of like kind of like muscle testing in a way and i think you kind of referenced that already right like when you muscle test you get like a yes or a no that's kind of like your body just with, without the muscle testing giving you a yes or no or or you know whatever it is like giving you a yes or no like life giving you the universe giving you a yes or no um but i never thought about like the rocks chipping your car like windshield and things like that as a message too so that's they right. definitely very interesting think about and whatever it might be it could be something on social media um and you're right the more you work on yourself you get to a point where you're like wow i feel pretty good i feel pretty good and maintain that and give yourself a good pat on the back because it takes a tremendous amount of courage that is not seen i'll tell you what i've had i don't know how many mentors i've had over the last decade hundreds too many to count and I've had some great mentors that were very few, and I've had a lot of mentors that were ego driven and, you know, they would want to in some way, shape or form, tell you how great they were about something. <laughs> and then a few, a few group of mentors that said, you're going to be great and you're going to be greater than I ever was. Just take these lessons and learn from them. Take this and run, take this. Don't listen to the words I'm saying, understand the art of what I'm trying to show you and take that and run. And as you go through in life, when you have those messages, know that there's something in you that needs to come up. The universe will show you when it's time to do work. If you can sit there and try to think of something that would bother you and nothing gives you, you don't get any feelings from it, that's healed. Nobody has anything that bothers them that doesn't show up with a body feeling. And I think that's very important to differentiate because all the methods I've studied, I've studied emotional code, body code as well, um, you name it. And what I've learned is the, the newest findings in neuroscience show that we actually don't have emotions. We create them. We reconstruct them. Okay. Um, and how that works is because the very first thing that occurs is we have a body feeling a sensation somewhere. And it can happen anywhere. A body feeling. When we have that body feeling, our nervous system within nanoseconds is scanning all of our past references, looking back at everything that's ever happened to us, almost in a way of saying, have we ever felt this before? And it scans and it looks back to its references all the way back into the womb, creates a collaborative story and comes back. By the time that story hits us, it's an emotion. When we have that emotion, the emotion is not the problem but yet we think it is. The body feeling is what shows us there's something there. The emotion is our brain just quickly reconstructing something. Do you want to play with that a bit and see how it works? <laughs> yeah, sure. Can you think of anything that would cause you to have anxiety that would make you feel anxious? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I want you to create that in your mind. Create that scene, whatever it is. That would cause you to have a feeling of anxiety. And when you have that, just nod your head and let me know it's there. Okay? Ask yourself this simple question now. What else could this be? And pay attention to that anxiety. Okay. When you notice that, when you ask that question, what happens in anxiety? Uh, dissipated. Or it, dissipated. Right. Dissipated. That's the, that's the word everyone says. It didn't disappear, mm -hmm. but it dissipated quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you created anxiety. And when you said, what else could this be? Your mind goes, ah, oh, let's go back to the drawing board. And it went back <laughs> and suddenly that anxiety disappeared, but the body feeling remained, mm -hmm. right? The body feeling remained because it was still there, but the anxiety dissipated. So this just goes to show how when we have an emotional shift take place, uh, our brain has just reconstructed something that's not actually accurate, and it can be, it can be very liberating to realize that. If you, if you would have said to yourself, what else could this be, and it stayed there, the next question to ask is, is this mine? Is this mine? And suddenly it'll dissipate too because it's, 
It could be a grandfather's. It could be someone in the room next to you. It might not be yours. Okay. Just a very powerful way of playing with the keyboard of how our GPS, how our nervous system works. Uh, another, another way of separating us from the consciousness that we are, the compressed consciousness, is um, I want you to say this. Say, um, I'm a man. I'm a man. Okay. And say, I am Tanner. I am Tanner. And feel do an inventory of your body. And I want you to say this. I have the experience of being a man. I have the experience of being a man. I have the experience of having the name Tanner. I have the experience of having a name Tanner. And notice how those felt different. Yep. You notice there was a subtle shift in that. Mm -hmm. Because when you're saying, I'm a man, I am Tanner, you're identifying as that. And that's not you. You're having an experience of being a man. You're basically consciousness. When you leave the physical body, you're no longer a man. <laughs> According to all these 300 people that have had near-death experiences and the, and the uh, over half dozen I've interviewed, nobody goes into that non-physical mind. It's like a broadcast that a TV picks up and suddenly realizes, hey, I'm here and my skin's still white or my skin's black. <laughs> they don't – none of that. They become pure consciousness. And when you say, I have the experience of being a man, you suddenly felt something distant you from that before. You felt a change, didn't you? Mm -hmm. That's just a way of showing your body is much more than you're aware of. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, we're compressed consciousness into form. And what my work is about is getting people back to that moment almost taking them through a near life experience where they can picture when they get a sensation of life with no burdens and through a law of mind that says there's a law of mind that says once the mind is perceives something it can never snap back and take that back i can't if i if i gave you a, a knowledge bomb about something i can't take that knowledge back from you if i drew a green triangle here and put a smile face in it you can never unsee that. Once the mind takes something, it snaps back. That's the critical faculty at work, the protective barrier at work. Okay. So when we take these people back to times when they've never experienced bliss, they've never experienced harmony, they've never experienced a life without pain or torment, take them back and let them see where that pain and torment came from and see that it's not theirs. And the person that spilled over didn't do it intentionally. They did it because that's all they were carrying. And like a kettle spilling hot boiling liquid over on the stove, that's what occurred. They experienced something they've never experienced before. The mind has suddenly recognized something that it didn't notice before, and that's theirs to keep. And then we have ways of amplifying that feeling and locking it in so um, it's it becomes their identity on how they feel about themselves afterwards. Wow. That's fascinating. You know, I, I definitely felt like a different feeling when I said that. And I've constantly thought about it, like, well, I'm, I'm not really Tanner. Like I could easily have been called something else when I was born. Right. Like, right. It's not really who I am. Um, like who really am I? Am I? You're infinite. Yep. Exactly. You're an infinite being. Mm -hmm. And you're already, you already have everything you want, everything you need. You really do. It's all there. Quantum physics says everything that's ever existed or ever will exist is right here, right now for us. Why aren't we seeing it? <laughs> Our perceptions block that out. Our perceptions that are put in the womb block that out. Okay. And, and again, reinforced over time, but they're always there for us. And one of the most powerful things you can do and tell yourself over and over and over and teach your child young young you're an infinite being all your needs are met all your needs are met at every moment in time if he found that perception if if you give him that perception at one and just tell him not this stuff of how how often do we hear this i want to be this when i grow up yeah. <laughs> whatever right <laughs> how many times do we hear that what's that just formed in that kid's perception mm-hmm Tell your one-year-old all the time, you're an infinite being, all your needs are met. 
at every moment in time and point in space. Imagine if you build that perception up in him and he grows up to be a, a child and he grows up to be you know, a young teenager. He grows up to be an adult that has that perception. The world is his. Mm -hmm. Anything he wants, he'll be able to get because beliefs, beliefs are what form reality. James Allen said, whenever you believe comes as a fact. Joseph Murphy says, whatever, whatever's impressed in the subconscious mind is amplitude is magnified into space. Okay. And again, Bruce Lipton beliefs are everything. The perception, the perception is everything. Yep. That's, that's powerful. I, I, I love that because I, I totally agree that the beliefs are really everything, uh, especially through reading. Like I actually have one of Joseph Murphy's books as well. Um, and, re and really reading the biology of belief, like learning about like epigenetics and how like beliefs even affect our like genes and our, our actual cells, like, from inwards out like it's even more than like than what i had believed before that before reading that book um and me as well as a doctor yeah. me as well as a doctor i mean uh I, i'll tell you this the people that contact me um for care are the last i'll just say this the last five women i've worked with that had breast cancer were all under 12 percent body fat they all had a water bottle they wore tight spandex and they look great. They look great. They ate organic food. They drank filtered water. They did everything correct. And boom, cancer out of nowhere because of some deep, deep down perception they had of themselves. That was perhaps theirs or maybe not theirs. Uh, that came from their childhood or it was something else from a um, an ancestor, a grandfather or something else. So yeah, I've seen your post talking about that before, like doesn't matter how much organic food you eat, you can still, you know, develop these diseases. So do you think, you know, eating organic and like, you know, watching what you eat is important still? Um, does, does it play a role? Like obviously the, the emotions and like what you actually feel like when you were like a child kind of trumps that or like not really, I guess not emotions, but like that deep seated feeling like that, that belief trumps it. But I have to imagine still like what you put into your body still makes a, a difference, right? <laughs> truly, truly. Uh, you know, I, that never means that you can just go eat whatever you want, especially right. with the stuff there is today. The, mm -hmm. um, I shared, I did a lecture about eight years ago on genetically modified organisms mm -hmm. and I shared slides and one of the slides had a hamster, uh, who was, uh, you know, fed regular, normal, um, food. And they started feeding these hamsters genetically, mod organized, uh, genetically modified organisms. And within three generations, this hamster was growing hair inside of his mouth. So uh, I think a connection with consciousness is mandatory because of the amount of toxins that we're exposed to. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, For instance, glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, yep. is now estimated to be in about 75% of our rain. So it's a, it's a water-soluble antibiotic essentially uh founded in 1970 japanese scientists founded it created it found how dangerous it was put it on the shelf and then monsanto bought it years later and now it's re-infactured and made for pennies on the dollar and it's the most common herbicide plant it's not even an herbicide though it has no patents on it for an herbicide it's an antimicrobial that's water soluble so it can go in anywhere in the in the environment including the rain and this so we're we have to develop a perceptual belief that we're much more than we are that's that's mandatory but as you're talking about foods and organic foods and all that very much i mean my my house is filled with organic foods and i drink lots of water and things like that um but all too often if we have a program inside of us that says i shouldn't be here or mom and dad would be better off if I were dead, formed in the womb, developed over time and added perceptions of like the 12 year old in the, in the dodgeball experience. You know, there's a number of things, social media, the magazines, all these different things that make you feel less than less than you should feel. Add to that perception by the time that that self mutilation program matures around 30 or 40, 
it doesn't matter how much organic food you have, the subconscious will the subconscious will absolutely make that the pass. On the other side of that, if a person has a deep perception of loving everything about life, about themselves, forgiveness, bathe in forgiveness on everything, and they only see the best in life. In other words, when you go, you know, I went to, I took my daughter to the zoo yesterday. And there's some obese people around and there's people in wheelchairs that are, that are big. When I look at them instantly, I see a spiritual being played out from the perceptions as a kid. I don't see a woman obese there who's sabotaging herself. I see a spiritual being. If I see her and I say, huh, look at her. She's sitting there, you know, bathing in bacon grease and all this, eating this stuff. I'm reflecting that out suddenly. I'm suddenly no better than her on that level momentarily. Even if I eat organic food, the minute I start making judgments on other people or myself, it, it, it really has an impact on you. So when you walk around and you look at everyone as spiritual beings, just like yourself, um, it, it keeps you in such a harmony. It keeps your cells vibrating in such a blissful state that, uh, the, you know, you're just internal peace. And when that happens, I promise you, you are a lot more resilient to toxins and you're a lot more resilient to, um, you know, normal things that would, would make someone else sick. Mm -hmm. When a person, when you sit down and eat, and this has puzzled me for years until I understand what it is now. It's a subconscious program using an opportunity. I've, I've always been puzzled by a group of people that could sit down and have uh, the same meal, eat the same meal. And one person gets food poisoning because the fish was bad or something. But three other people that ate that same fish have no impacts whatsoever. Same can be said with a moldy house. And I know I hear, I, I understand about MTHFR. I know it's a, you know, there's a genetic component where you're unable to act folate. So your detox pathways don't work correctly. I get that. But I've seen people over and over and over, uh, spouses and wives and spouses that, that uh, come in to see me in clinic and the husband is crippled up from Lyme disease and the wife is completely unaffected by it. And yet they both have it. It's in their blood. How come this man's crippled by this disease and this woman has no symptoms whatsoever? A subconscious mind manifesting any way it can a self-destruction program. I know of spouses in the house. The woman's just, just completely um, a mess from all the mold in the house. They open the, they open a door, they open a, they, they rip off a wall and there's mold all in there. And she's like, see, that's why I'm sick. All this mold. And the husband's sitting there looking at it, eating crackers, not affected at it whatsoever. I've seen this, I've seen these kind of subconscious programs of loving life and seeing only the good in life and other people make a man who's 78 years old, smokes a pack a day, loves cheeseburgers, healthier and stronger than people around him that are half his age. Now, that's never an invite to just go smoke and do all those things. <clears throat> But it's just a it's a it's to give you an awareness of how powerful your perceptions are that create your reality. And Dr. Bruce Lipton is a friend of mine. We've talked many times. I've I've seen him many times. Um, he would totally agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. Probably the smartest cell physiologist, one of the smartest cell physiologists on the planet, and he would definitely agree with, you know, your perception is everything. Mm -hmm. There's another doctor. Um, who went out and did research in the Hansa territory years ago, and I have his, I have his journal somewhere. A doctor with um, various degrees in nutrition, he went out to the Hansa territory in Nepal near Russia. He found a group of people that were working in the fields at 120 years old, and still there at 135 and 140 years old. And as a 135-year-old woman, he cited he, – he followed this woman around and cited her. She was breaking beans with her hands, singing lullabies for kids. All these people had never heard of a calorie. They ate everything 
including all kinds of various junk food and all this other stuff. If that's not enough, they drink tremendous amounts of vodka. And this woman that he cited, he followed around, smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. She was smoking the whole time. He said, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day? Two packs a day, 135 years old, breaking beans with her hands, still functional as an adult. And this completely baffled this doctor. And he said, what is the secret? What, what's, what is the missing piece? Inner peace. Inner peace. These people had, they don't, there's no programs of self-mutilation running around there. It's all acceptance, songs, forgiveness. There's a, uh, and I guess the best way I could say this is they have the identity of what would be better termed the Hawaiian prayer, uh, Ho'oponopono. Have you ever heard of that before? I feel like I've heard it, but I don't know. What does, what does it mean? Okay, it's a Hawaiian prayer that dates back to a time when a uh, there was a therapist who actually um, completely caused a ward of, of psychiatric patients that were quite dangerous, medicated and, and shackled. Uh, he, he did this prayer to himself over and over while he was in there. He was assigned to watch these people. And when he did this to himself... As we already talked about, the mind beyond the brain, that spilled out and actually helped these people heal. And within four years, the uh, that entire institute, that mental institute shut down. So Ho'oponopono is a simple um, mantra to say over and over and over to yourself, something fantastic to introduce your son to. And it starts out by saying this, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you those four phrases and you just say them over and over and over with intention you know and when that gets into the unconscious and you have that kind of vibration going off that's your perception going off you're going to find that people will go like this hey you know that's no you're all right you're all right with me yeah <laughs> because again it's a mirror reflected it's a mirror you know messengers so that um, those populations of people in the Hansa territory had something similar to that going on as their deepest, deepest perception. I love you. Forgive me. I'm sorry for whatever I've done, whatever I may have done or whatever my father's done or whatever my brother did to you. I apologize for that now. Forgive me. And I love you, which means very, very strict definition of love. I've seen people be hurt by the word love. So anytime I use the word love, I always want to define it. Love means I only see the best in you. I welcome you in my presence. And I'm filled with joy to have you in my presence. Because I've seen I've seen people um I've seen people do work with different therapists and somewhere along the line the person was in a suggestible state and they said to him, You just need to love yourself more. And suddenly that person starts binge eating, drinking, um, even sleepwalking to you know, to stuff themselves in the middle of the night, stuffing themselves with junk food because they were told to love themselves more. Well, how could that be? Their perception of love was criticism and self mutilation. Mm -hmm. So they were born into a house where, uh, you know, just, just imagine this, Tanner. I, I did that because I love you, mm -hmm. you know? So when you become an adult, what's your definition of love going to be? You know, those kind of behaviors. So we want to be very clear in what love means. And if you have that with your son, I only see the best in you. I welcome you in my presence and I'm filled with joy to have you in my presence. Uh, you can tell the feeling of those words just saying the word love completely different. Well, that's that's super interesting because I, I, I totally can see how like that could be true because like love definitely does mean different things for different people. Uh, especially like on a subconscious level, like every consciously that people are like, Oh yeah, I love, like you treat me nicely. Right. Like you, you, you love me, you, you respect me, but subconsciously that's not really the case. Like it's not the same, same definition that we, we believe it is. Um, I could definitely right. see that. So in your work, do you teach people about the subconscious mind or you really just go and do the healing for them? And then, go from there 
No, I do both. I, okay. I do both because um, every person that that contacts me and and we are on the verge of opening the doors on Psychosomatic University, which would be a first of its kind accredited university teaching people about the mind beyond the brain, what the mind really is, and how there's four levels of mind. There's the there's the conscious mind that we're all aware of. There's the subconscious mind, which just makes up this torus field that we have around us. Our unconscious, which is deep within us that regulates our heart rate and things like that. Um, and then, of course, that critical faculty is part of the mind, too, that must be acknowledged and understood. Okay. Um, so every client of mine, I show them a blueprint of their mind. I show them how it works. I show them what they're aware of, what they're not aware of, and how it's a protective mind. So it'll protect any perception that you have, good or bad. It'll protect it. Good or bad, it's going to protect it. So they... So they know what they're kind of, you know, what what's going on. They have a little bit more awareness of them. And then we usually do um, a almost like a, a paperwork to where it shows, you know, you're going to do everything I ask you to do. You're going to follow instructions. You know, everything I'm doing is for your best bet. And, um, you know, then we get started if it's a good match. So it, to just go in and do some healing for them and not show them what, uh, you know, what their mind is like and, you know, they have a they have a much better understanding of themselves. If I went and just did the work, um, I think I'd be doing a disservice for that person. They they need to understand the things operating below the surface and how that language works because it doesn't use words. The subconscious mind does not use words at all. It's like the autonomic nervous system and the central nervous system have completely different languages, and these two are are uh, unable to you know collaborate through just english words alone well wow. that's super interesting uh that's awesome that you teach that's, that's not exactly what i do is i try to teach people about the subconscious mind i feel like understanding that too kind of gives them like more understanding going forward so that they don't like put those negative beliefs those negative programs on themselves right because there you can obviously when you're an adult it's not as easy to install programs as when you're a kid, but you can still be programming yourself negatively or adding on to those previous programs. Um, exactly. Yeah. You know, so for anyone who's out there, like who is self-sabotaging, who is, you know, maybe feeling like they're broken because they keep trying to make the changes, you know, like they're like, Oh, I just want to eat healthy, but I keep reaching for the junk food or I just want to start working out, but I buy a gym membership and never go like, what is your advice for them? Like how, how can they start to make moves forward there? Well, they first need to become aware that there's something deep inside of them that's running the show that uh, again, is is not a, anything that they're going to get nothing. Let me study and get this. Um, it's not anything that's going to just pop up into your awareness. So you have to start understanding that. And then what you want to do is, is, understand that the way you're going to get into this subconscious mind is through intense emotional states mm -hmm. and repetition too. But I've noticed that repetition can take a long, long time. Mm -hmm. If I, I know people that have done work for years, repetitive work and, and made little to no progress. And when you're, when you're putting that much effort and time in, it can be frustrating and that's why it can cause many people to give up. So what you want to do is is know that your mind is going to fight you and it's because of that barrier protecting any perception that that's there good or bad and just start studying yourself and start working towards that goal and every time you every time you notice there's a little resistance you know or you you want to eat healthy but you reach for the junk food just know that there's a part of you that is fighting to keep that there okay mm -hmm. it's been said this the unconscious mind is terrified of anything new and if you recognize that it can give you a little bit of of understanding of what's going on so you're not beating yourself up okay but you the thing you want to do is you want to get around people that that have the same kind of goals in mind, even if they aren't physically around you, you can have great mentors that like Joseph Murphy, I would say he's one of my best mentor, his mentor, uh, Reverend Thomas Trode is one of my best mentors. I don't think anyone knew the mind better than this man. 
Thomas Trode uh, was, I, I know a story, he was on a coach, a, a wagon with uh, like a the carriage with the horses, you know, the horse-drawn carriage. And he was invited to a uh, a doctor's house. who's an Indian uh, uh, doctor. And when he arrived to this man's house, the butler uh, floated right through the door. And Thomas Trode immediately goes, man, this guy knows way more than I do. Right. So um, it sounds far fetched. Some people will go, oh, no. But then think about Greg Braden's hand print he saw on the mountain. Think about the baby chickens influencing a robot. There's another world out there that we're all a part of. And the more you invest in knowing this world and knowing more and more about yourself, the more you realize that um, you really are an infinite being and you can become anything you want to. Well, yeah, then I think of the remote viewing as well and everything like that. So that's, yeah, I completely agree with that. It's It's some really great information you've talked about and shared. Um, so really, I, I mean, we've, we've talked about a lot of really good things so far. You know, we talked about like your, your, um, uh, work, uh, pretty much addressing self-sabotage and that, that feeling going back to it. Um, I'm just trying to collect my thoughts from everything we've talked about. Sorry. One second here. Um, wow. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm really kind of just blown away from some of the information you share because like a lot of it I've somewhat knew, but then I haven't really pieced some of it together. And so it's, it is very interesting um, to hear, like you talk about some of these things. So if, if people want to be able to, you said you're opening your doors for the course, when right. does that open it up and how many spots do you have? Like, what does that look at? Is like, is it all online as well? It'll be all online. Um, I'm very interactive. So one thing about me is whenever somebody, um, hires me as a, um, uh, a teacher for them or, or I, I'm not really a coach, I'm a psychosomatic, you know, professional. And what I want to do is teach people how to replicate how the art and science of psychosomatic medicine. So when someone hires me, um, we have ongoing classes every other Tuesday. So it's very interactive. Um, I, the last thing I want to do is sell you a weekend course and here you go you're on your own mm -hmm. okay i have found that that's when you if anyone that does this kind of work and and let's say you pay for a weekend course and you do it you're going to hit roadblocks you're going to hit limitations to that and to have someone to be able to show you oh yeah that's that's what's going on this is why that limitation there this is why that roadblock try this instead next time or do this instead has been very very helpful um so in June, our doors open on Psychosomatic University, a legit accredited program where people get accredited masters and PhDs. And what this university is, is completely different than anything else out there. My wife is also attending Quantum University. It's night and day on this. Um, I'm, Psychosomatic University is giving healers or people that want to be healers uh, the technology and the understanding to become super healers, an elite group of healers that are able to handle the most terminal and chronic of ill cases when things like nutrition and acupuncture and Reiki and functional medicine do not answer for. I've worked with many people that, like I said, when they contact me, if I told them to eat organic food and drink filtered water mm. and avoid toxins, they've done that for years, mm. right? but they're still ill. So what it comes down to is an echelon, a scale of how illnesses work. Okay. So if you look at the lighter end of the scale where there's, uh, you know, pretty easy to handle little illnesses and colds, if you apply a light healing technique to this lighter end of the scale, you'll get results. The person will heal. They'll start to feel better. If you keep applying that light healing technique up the up this chart you'll eventually find when it becomes ineffective then you'll need something more grounded something a little deeper and to go up the scale on these um, growing heaviness of illnesses and as you go up the scale if you keep applying that more grounded technique you'll soon get to a stage where it doesn't work 
then you'll need something stronger. You'll go up the scale and eventually it works or it, it stops working or it's ineffective for that person. What Psychosomatic University does is it gives you the training and the understanding to know how to handle the most terminal of cases. People were unresponsive to everything else. And it's, again, using some of these things that I kind of talked about, going in, establishing true forgiveness in that person, allowing them to use parts of the mind to see where that pain came from, and they see it firsthand. Um, did the same thing with a 17-year-old girl the other day who uh, cuts, okay, mm -hmm. cuts, uh, regressed to a cause. She was four years old, and it wasn't in the womb. It was four years old whenever the mom had um slammed the door shut on her and she was trapped in a garage banging on the door and i even asked her i said you know is it possible that um your mom did this by accident no nope she knew right away this little four-year-old girl knew right away that it was the mom and in intentionally did that to her so right then and there uh, you know i can't just paint the scene over we'll just pretend your mom didn't you know, with the girl that's cutting us a little bit more severe. That's that's a very heavy, heavy perception of self-mutilation. Mm -hmm. So I had to have her look into her mom's eyes. And we did a few other little things. But ultimately, long story short, I took her right into her mom, right up until her mom, all the way to her when her mom was about three years old. And when she looked at her mom's three years old, she saw that her mom had a tremendous amount of pain and anger. And again, like the kettle spilling out, she realized... Slamming the door had nothing to do with me. It had to do with a person that was hurting, a little girl that was hurting. And that's when they can establish real forgiveness. It's almost like um, if you don't go back to that first experience, the very first in hypnotic, in hypnotic terms, it's called the initial sensitizing event, the very first pie in the face. Welcome to the party, pal. If you don't go back to that first event, it's leaving a root and it will st and it will still regrow what i find is a lot of healers uh, intention you know they do great work but a lot of times they're getting to some other area a, a subsequent sensitizing event something that's actually occurred that's compounded that but not getting to the actual first one when you get to the very first one and change it it's like a domino having an effect on all the other ones all the other pieces fall into place that subconscious mind self mutilation program instantly changes from self mutilation to self preservation to self preservation uh, to to preserving the self right away, and it's a remarkable thing to see. You see it in someone's face right away, and that's when you know that real healing has occurred for that person. So, how do you actually like locate that very first one? Like, is it just through your technique that you're able to do that, or like? Is it like the way you open it up, the subconscious mind like knows to go back to that point? Or no, what's... you rarely, you'll rarely get to that first. You'll rarely, it'll rarely take you to that first one. So you have to okay. do some detective work. Okay. What I found, and I'm, I'm also a master level hypnotherapist, but what I found is using frequencies to open that critical faculty allows us to pipeline to it much quicker than trying to just bypass that, bypass that critical faculty and have it slam shut at any time. You could be doing something with a person. You've got past it, and that all it takes is that critical faculty to their conscious mind to kind of start wake up a bit and slam shut again. And they say, "You know, you're you're outside that perception again." Um, so, I know there's a, a, a group of remarkable healers out there doing fantastic work, and they're doing great changes on this. So it's not just my method. This is right. just something that I've put together from you know being a doctor for over the last decade. Uh, when you combine my wife's experience with our experience, we have over 20 years of working with people, whether it's nutrition or whether it's, you know, emotional type work. Um, but it, it's, it's about going back and changing that earliest one, because if you, if you don't change that initial perception, it has a chance there's something left that has, it has the ability to regrow. And that's oftentimes where people are trying to do change work. And yet everything kind of comes back. They're trying to eat healthy and they're doing some great work and they're listening to some, you know, some headphones at night or something. And they still are, are you know, making the choices. They're, they're still something in them driving to go back to that. It's because there's still some root left there. And, and 
you know, just like a piece that would regrow, it has the ability to re-sprout and grow all those back. So when you're using the frequencies, is it like a tuning fork or is it like a machine? No, it's just through intention. Oh, it's just okay. through intention. Wow. Because as you can tell, uh, anything the mind can perceive, the mind can create. Mm -hmm. So I work 100%, 100% through Zoom. And I rarely have anyone buy supplements or something. The the rare occasion I will is if, you know, I had a gentleman contact me a while back. And in his history, he was concerned about cardiovascular disease. And I saw that his grandpa and his dad both had strokes. So right then and there, I thought he has something, you know, hereditary that's that's um, called a lipoprotein A. It's a, a genetic clotting factor. Okay. And so I said, look, before we get started, uh, let me test you out energetically. And what I used was uh, a modified version of what's called contact reflex analysis. There's meridians on the body to where uh, whenever we have an infection going on, or if there's something going on, it's like the body electrifies that circuit and, a, and an acupuncture meridian gets hot. Uh, it, it Not hot physically to the touch, but energetically. And this is where you can actually muscle test people and touch right allergy, left allergy, metabolic point, yeast, virus, parasite, toxin. You can find these. And if you touch one that's hot, muscle testing, you'll get a response. Or if you touch their arm, their arm will drop right down because that point's hot. So I, through Zoom, I said artery, artery, and his artery was red hot, red hot artery reflex. And I thought, hey, before we do any kind of emotional work, you know, um, you're a potential time bomb. So I had him do some lab work. And of course, his lipoprotein A was um, like 200 some, and it should be, it should be under 30. So I said, okay, we're going to get you on a specific protocol of nutritional things. Uh, because this is a clotting factor, I have to dissolve it out. If it's a homocysteine, you have to metabolize it out with specific nutrients. So I still will add functional medicine in when necessary. But oftentimes these people have been functional medicine out the wazoo and they have bags of supplements. And the last thing I want to do is say, here, add some more B12 to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the last thing I want to do. Um, so in the case of that, I had him start a protocol before with verifiable lab work before we ever did um, some deeper emotional stuff. Okay. But it's, it's intention. I sit here with him. And the very first thing I do is say, okay, I'm going to run a frequency through you. And I have them do a few little test phrases, run that frequency through them, and they feel a shift. Suddenly they feel a change. And I say, okay, now um, let's anchor you into heart-brain coherence. We get them into the heart-brain coherence. I anchor them into safety a few different ways. So if we ever go back and kick some hornet nest or I take them into a moment where um, you know, mom and dad were fighting or something very overwhelming is going on, that it's not so overwhelming for them. They can see that and their their physiological state is anchored in bliss and peace before we ever go in. Because I don't want them to have to relive a very overwhelming experience. And then in that moment, I can do things. I can take them before. I can take them all areas of that scene uh, to where it's not bothering them, but they still have a particular focus on where that's coming from, what caused it. So I can take them out of that scene and before it and everywhere else if I need to. And then we can do some work. Okay. Sometimes if they, if we take them to a scene and it's so overwhelming, we might take them before it ever happened, give them all kinds of bliss, harmony, connect them with divine, everything, and then let them go through that scene. And as they go through that scene, I'm saying, tell me what happens. Tell me what happens when that bully bothers you. Watch it very specifically. What are you noticing? And they're like, yeah, it's not even that big a deal. Now we've just convinced the subconscious that this overwhelming thing that they've carried for the years is not that big a deal. So, you know, it, it's just a matter of everyone's experience is unique. Everyone's trauma is as unique as their own fingerprint. And what you have to do is just um, play a little bit of detective work. You have to, if sometimes if I hit something, I'll know automatically it's not the initial one. So we'll just keep doing detective work until we get to what I suspect is the initial one. And everyone's different. A person who is 
born into a welcome family, uh, you know, but they have got some things bothering them. That can be like a flick of salt. Okay. But a person that was born in a, and they were, they were conceived by accident, born into a family that's completely critical criticism uh, and distance. And that's all they know their whole life. And they come to me as a 40 year old with depression and all they've ever known is criticism and ridicule their entire life. Finding that initial one is like taking a handful of sand and throwing it out a window and trying to find the first particle that hit first. It's a wrestling match. And it will it should be for anyone that takes on a case like that. It's not like, well, I can handle it right away. No. Sometimes it's like a handful of salt, a handful of sand that just you threw at a wall and you're trying to figure out what particle hit first. It's a wrestling match. And I tell them that I never know until we get started in this work. Once I get a chance to see what's going on unconscious wise, then I'm, I'm honest with them. I say this, this is a wrestling match. I shoot for the stars every time. And, but your unconscious is going to reveal what it reveals to us, you know? So. Well, that's powerful. I think the work you're doing is definitely very much needed in our world, especially, you know, with our current society, the way it's set it up is, or the way it is set up right now. Uh, so, you know, your your course is coming out soon, or your actual, not course, your actual university is coming out soon. The doors are opening up. Uh, so I'm going to put your links down in the description below so people can find your work, find you on social media. Uh, just real quickly, where can they find you? Uh, TheSubconsciousHealer.com. Um, and psychosomaticuniversity.com. Great. Awesome. Okay. And are you, you're on, I know you're on Facebook. Are you on Instagram or anywhere else? Um, I'm on various platforms. I'm on different ones. So, so you should be able to see, uh, you should be able to see me on different ones. I don't do a lot of advertising. I'll get on Facebook once in a while and put posts up. That's the one I'm usually on. Mm -hmm. But my, my wife, operates a lot of the other ones and right. um so i don't know a, a tremendous amount of those other ones that i'm on <laughs> no problem. um but uh you're doing fantastic work as well tanner Thank educating you. people on the mind the subconscious because uh, first rule of influence is if you don't know about mm -hmm. something it doesn't mean it's still not having an impact on you mm -hmm. so if you become aware of of your subconscious mind and and how it operates um, you can start to um, you can start to acquire the tools necessary for change. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's, it's so important. Like I know like for me, like when I learned this information, I was like, I went from like feeling like I was broken or like there was something wrong with me to like, well, that's why it's happening. Like there's nothing wrong with it. I'm working exactly how I'm designed to work. It's just I've had the right. wrong inputs. So that's exactly that's right. Really powerful. It, it takes, you know, away from that, like that victim mentality kind of gives you your power back kind of like, you know, like what you do, but I'm really interested in hearing more. Uh, so I'll have to check out your website and your uh, university. Um, but I, I'm so grateful that you came on today, Gabe, uh, really great to connect. And just, it was some fantastic information to, to learn. And uh, I'm sure all my listeners are probably very fascinated as well. So thank you so much. Um, uh just, just very grateful thank you so much for coming on the podcast today well thanks for having me tanner and uh it's been great and reach out to me if you have any questions or anything i can help you out with okay awesome thank you gabe you're welcome